Every great investment you've ever made started with the right connections. Connections to the world's most sought after investment community dedicated to improving business and society. You are part of this community. Welcome to iConnections Global Alternatives Conference. In eight short months, managers and allocators who control a combined 60 trillion in assets have used our platform. But as you know, there's more to our story. Funds for Food was the largest capital introduction conference of 2020, facilitating over 3,000 meetings with the industry's most sophisticated investors, while also raising nearly $2 million supporting those in need during the pandemic. We followed this with Fund Women Week, the largest capital introductions conference in 100 Women in Finance's history. Initiatives like these are at the heart of iConnection's mission. In early 2022, we will combine the latest in virtual and in-person participation at the world-famous Fountain Blue Hotel Miami. You are part of this community because you are the people with the vision to improve society. Invest in progress. Welcome to the world of iConnections. Hello everyone, I'm Ron Biscardi, the CEO of iConnections. I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this year's Global Alternatives Conference. This is our first year hosting this event, and of course, it's virtual. But we are looking forward to our first in-person Global Alts event, which will be held at the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami Beach during Hedge Fund Week in January 2022. This event will feature world-class content prepared by the iConnections Investment Institute, followed by two days of one-on-one -on -one capital introduction meetings, which we project will number over 10,000. This event will be free for allocators and open to managers who are members of the iConnections platform. So if you're not already a member, please go to iConnections.io to learn more. Thank you for joining us and stay safe and healthy. Welcome to the iConnections Global Alternatives Conference. I'm Shelley Rosenzweig, a partner in the investment management group at Haynes & Boone, a commercial law firm with more than 575 lawyers globally. Haynes & Boone is ranked among the largest US-based firms by the National Law Journal. While this year's Global Alternatives Conference is virtual, I'm thrilled to be welcoming you from the lobby of the Fountain Blue Hotel, the 2022 location of iConnections Global Alternatives Conference iConnections was founded with the goal of creating a platform that helps the industry exchange ideas and stay connected. And this panel is no exception. I'm delighted to introduce today's speakers, Peter Zihan and Marco Papich. Peter Zihan is a geopolitical strategist and has worked for the US State Department in Australia and helped develop the analytical models for Stratford. He is a critically acclaimed author whose latest title, Disunited Nations, The Scramble for Power in an Ungoverned World became available in March of 2020. Peter will be interviewed today by Marco Papich, partner and chief strategist at Clock Tower Group and the author of Geopolitical Alpha, an investment framework for predicting the future. I will now turn it over to Peter and Marco and thank you. Hey everyone, Peter Zion here. It's uh... <laughs> it's it's been a crazy year. Uh, I actually had a presentation scheduled for January seventh, where I, the theme was to talk about why 2021 was going to be even more nutty than 2020, and of course, the events of the day before made the entire present kind of moot. Uh, it wasn't a surprise anymore. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of ground today. I'm going to talk about a lot of things that are probably going to make a lot of us very uncomfortable. So I want to start with something that we can all agree on, something that's not controversial. So let's begin with politics. The American political system is a first past the post single member district system, which is a fancy way of saying that when people run for office, they run for a very specific geographic chunk and they only need to get one more vote than whoever comes in second. Now this encourages our political parties in this country to be broad big tent organizations in order to get that marginal extra one vote in order to win. That means our parties are made up of factions. So here are your traditional Republican factions. Here are your traditional Democratic factions and then swing voters in the middle. 
It's a messy system. It's loud. The factions are always moving around. But I'm sure you'll recognize that in the last five years, things really haven't gone this way. A, a few things that have really shifted. So let's start with the Republicans. The national security conservatives actually liked Hillary Clinton because they saw her as the only member of the Obama administration that actually knew how the world worked. Pro-lifers realized that Donald Trump had been a pro-choice advocate for 30 years before running for president, so they didn't trust him. On the left, socialists, hey, <laughs> I love Bernie Sanders. He's just so delightfully and reliably out of touch. Uh, the Hillary campaign crushed him in, near the end and then forced him to capitulate and endorse her live on stage, and a third of his own audience woke, walked out. And the degree that they voted back in 2016, they didn't vote for her. They voted for, for, uh, for Trump. Unions liked the anti-free trade rhetoric of the Trump campaign. That was an easy sell. And then Catholics just wanted to take a shower. And here's where we actually ended up four years ago. Now, what this tells me is that we're in a period of political transition in the United States. And this is loud. And this is messy. But it also means that the old factions are moving, and we need to think of the system differently. So this little two-by-two two matrix is the best way I've discovered to kind of evaluate things. If you're on the far left, you think that the government should increase the tax take in order to reshape society in some way. If you're on the far right, you think that the government should stay out of your wallet. If you're at the top, you think the government should stay out of your personal life. And if you're at the bottom, you think that the government should play a role in regulating social morality. And of course, if you're in a corner, you can combine these things. So if you're at the bottom right, a social and an economic conservative, you probably oppose the food stamp program and you look forward to people starving because that builds character. And if you're at the top left, a social and an economic liberal, you look forward to the glorious day when we're all wearing government-issued gunny sacks that were paid for by the confiscation of all private property. Now, here are our swing voters in the same quadrant. Here are, is the traditional Democratic coalition. Here's the traditional Republican coalition. And here's everyone all together. Now, a lot has changed in the last two years. The parties that we know now are very different from what they were. The first, the biggest outcome is Donald Trump has energized the conservative populace. He's brought somewhere between 10 and 20 million voters in from the cold, people who hadn't voted in the last several elections who are suddenly politically active. They are by far now the largest single voting bloc in the United States, certainly within the Republican Party, and they control the party apparatus. We're not done. We're just starting. Fiscal conservatives. Now, that's a fun group. They've had a really crappy last 20 years. They kind of liked Bill Clinton because he balanced the budget, but then they had W, who ran the largest post-war deficits in the country's history, who then gave way to Obama, who doubled down on that strategy, who then gave way to Trump, who actually spent even more, and that's before coronavirus came in with all the deficit spending. They haven't had a friend in government in quite some time. And when they tried to put restrictions on what the Trump administration did, Trump agitated against them fiercely, drove them out of Congress, drove them out of his administration, and out of the Republican Party apparatus. They are no longer Republicans. Next up, national security, military voters. Trump treated the military as a prop, and they really did get off the, on the wrong foot and never recovered. And folks like General Mattis or General Kelly or General McMaster were treated awfully and driven out of the administration. And we saw the same thing happen with national security experts, whether they were in the intelligence field or DHS or the FBI or the military, that we saw with the fiscal voters. They were driven out of positions of influence throughout the entire system and throughout Congress. And they, too, are no longer Republicans. Business voters. It started off swimmingly. There were a lot of campaign contributions because Trump campaigned as a Republican. And as the initial year got underway, there were a number of business councils that were formed to advise Trump on economic issues. 
Trump disbanded all of them within six months uh, quite aggressively and then proceeded to purge this group. So the tax cuts were nice. The tax reform was nice. But then there was three years of erratic behavior. And if there's one thing the businesses really need, it's a level playing field that they understand the rules for. And that went away. But Trump didn't just drive people away. He also attracted some. The most important group was by far the unions. What we saw with the free trade rhetoric and the anti-free trade rhetoric was a group that was socially conservative but economically wasn't happy with the direction that the country had evolved in over the last 50 years. And Trump was really the first political leader to speak to that. And he was able to draw the majority of the unions to him. Catholics kind of went down the same road as the evangelicals. But where the evangelicals in their pursuit of political power really did stand shoulder to shoulder as a voting bloc, the Catholics had a split. And you had folks that were moving in a more secular direction, a more maybe egalitarian direction, who became a lot less interested in politics. And then you had this hardcore, probably a plurality, that went a different direction, stuck with the evangelicals and became very conservative on political issues. And so it's a smaller group, but it's a diehard Trumpist group. Hispanics are always the big surprise. I've lived in Texas for 20 years. I've seen this firsthand. Hispanics are among the most socially conservative voting blocs in the United States. And the issue that they are most conservative on is immigration. They like the idea of the wall. They like the idea of more power for ICE. And <laughs> I love this. They only support immigration as a rule once they're established. So we're talking like second, third generation here. They only support immigration for family reunification, but only for their family. And Trump ended up not just increasing the Republican take of the Hispanic vote to records, he actually captured almost every single county in the border zone, despite the fact, or honestly, because of the fact that they're vastly majority Hispanic. This is the current Republican coalition. And despite losing the national security, the business, and the fiscal voters, it is a larger group than the Republicans had before. It has become the natural ruling party of the country if it can hold together. Now, on the left, things are in motion as well. The most important takeaway is that the socialists have been ejected from the Democratic coalition. Wokeness, the violence that was associated with the Black Lives Matters protests, this really turned off a lot of people, not just on the right, also on the left. And the Biden team realizes that they're a lot more trouble than they're worth. So if you look at the top 800 people that Biden has so far appointed, not one of them comes from this camp. Talk that we had a few months ago about the possibility of Elizabeth Warren being the next Treasury Secretary, that was always silly, uh, but it's pretty much been killed. So all of these socialist dreams of the Green New Deal or debt forgiveness for students, you know, they're not happening at all. Now, I'm sure some of you are like, whoa, 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 whoa. What about, what about the protests? What about Portland? How can you say the socialists are still gone or still are gone? Portland is not normal. I mean, th this, this photo is exactly what it looks like. Th this is Darth Vader in a dress riding a unicycle playing a flame-throwing bagpipe. You should never look to Portland for an example of what America is or might be. Portland is no more representative of America than Disneyland. So this is where we are. We have a social conservative core that is very consolidated. They don't have a leader right now, but that'll change. And we have a democratic coalition that's a little bit all over the place that's trying to become more centrist. So this is where we are, or this is where we were until January 6th. Because the media has largely collapsed as a functional institution that gives us context and, and facts that we can actually use to make decisions, I'm going to have to underline something here. This wasn't a protest. This was a riot. A cop was killed. A cop was murdered. Murdered. That's the word. His skull was bashed in with a fire extinguisher. He was dragged from the Capitol complex, thrown into the crowd where he was beaten to death by a couple dozen people. One of the people who beat him used a pole that had the American flag on the other end. This isn't protected speech. Now, 
this can take us a few dark places because we also know that Donald Trump realized fully the sort of people that he was attracting. And when the Capitol complex was breached, we know that he danced in the Oval Office. There's some dark rabbit holes here. But the point I want to underline here is that the Republican Party has been unable to sufficiently condemn what happened and Trump's role in it. And as a result, it has given up moral authority on law and order issues. That's a problem moving forward for some, and it's an opportunity for others because the group that is most interested in law and order is this one. And if you combine Trump's actions, both before and on January 6th, towards the business community, it should come as no surprise that within a few hours, the majority of the American business community was calling on Mike Pence to eject Trump from office using Article 25 of the Constitution. Many companies, super conservative companies, have said that they will never contribute to Trump's political causes again or the political causes of anyone who voted to decertify the election. You add that in with what President Biden is doing with his cabinet, and it's clear the Democrats are making a bid for the business community. This is the potential Democratic alliance. Now, this isn't set in stone yet, and I don't want anyone to get too excited or too depressed. We're early in this process. But it has been five years since this political transition began. It makes sense that we're starting to see some of the edges of it. Now, if you're a national security, fiscal, or business conservative, now is the time in case you want to try to take your party back, because I think it's safe to say that not everybody in that dark circle thinks it's a great idea to grab a can of bear mace and a flagpole and a Confederate flag and march on the Capitol and kill a cop. The Republican coalition is in turmoil right now. Now is the time to make a difference if that is what you want to do. But I also want to underline that this is not atypical for the United States. Our political factions shuffle every generation or two. This is our seventh time through this. We'll get through it. It'll be loud. It'll be messy. But in a few years, it'll be over, and we will have two new parties that we barely recognize by the status of 2015. All right. That's where that is. Now, for the United States to be involved in the global system, you need one of three things. First, you need global interests, and I'd argue we have never had that. We created the global order in order to fight the Cold War, and the Cold War ended 30 years ago. We never integrated our economy in the system. We're the least integrated economy in the world of size. Without that sort of global interest, you have to ask whether the United States has any desire to maintain globalization. And by this first measure, no. The second measure, a political culture that is capable of engaging the world, I'd argue January 6th put a bullet in that idea. Even if Biden is the guy who's going to unify us, how long do you think it's going to take him? An hour? His whole term? more time than he has, you don't do this overnight. And the last time, we had to get pushed by World War II to even consider it. Third, you need a global footprint. And that's out of the question, too. The United States is done with war for a little bit, probably at least a decade. And right now, we have fewer troops stationed abroad than at any time since the 1890s. The deployments in the Middle East are nearly zero. Deployments in Europe are being slimmed down. And the ones that the Pacific are barely holding steady. This is it, folks. It's over. The country that maintained the global system has decided, left, right, and center, that it's done. That's the strategic side of the picture. The economic side is, if anything, even darker for globalization. This is a standard demographic profile. Children on the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top, men on one side, women on the other. This is what we call a consumption-led system, because anytime you have a lot of people age 40 and under, it's all about the spending on cars and education, raising kids, buying homes. Now, this is Mexico. And when American political leaders and American business leaders look at a demography like Mexico's, we really like what we see. Two big reasons. First of all, 
all those young Mexicans buy a lot of American products because Mexico can't produce enough to feed them all, to supply them all with what they need. Second, young folks are not super skilled in terms of their careers, their, their low value add, their mid value add. So that's what Mexico does in manufacturing, the low and the mid, the assembly. That's not what the American workforce does. We do the high end, we do the design. So the propensity for integration of supply chains and intertwining of economies is huge. Mexico became America's largest trading partner in 2019. It is a position they will not give up in our lives. This is a partner. And this is not. The Koreans had a baby bust 50 years ago. They'll never recover now. They've aged too much. There aren't enough young people to consume what they produce. In fact, look at all those 40, 50, and 60-year-olds, folks that have been on the job for three, even four decades, very productive, very highly value-added, going head-to-head -head with the American workforce. And because Korea can't consume enough of what it produces, they have to export it, and a lot of it comes here. We will always have trade disputes with the South Koreans, as long as we're trading with them at all. Now, from roughly 1980 to roughly 2015, the world was in the perfect demographic moment. We had a more or less rough balance of consumption-led systems like Mexico and export-led systems like Korea in an environment of absolute global security that the United States was maintaining. Trade grew at a faster rate than any time in history. Global GDP expanded faster than at any time in history, personal incomes increased at a faster rate than any time in history on a global scale. It was beautiful. But 20 years later, we are all 20 years older. And that balance is broken down. The world's consumption-led economies are turning into export-led. The export-led are turning into what I call post-growth, places like Japan that have simply aged out of being able to participate in either side of that equation. We need a new economic model. We're not going to figure that out in the next couple of years. For the United States, it's a partial exception story. Our demography is not aging nearly as rapidly as anyone else's. In fact, aside from the New Zealanders, we're the slowest aging society in the world right now. There's really one thing to underline here. The baby boomers, largest generation in our history. There's two things that are going on with them. Number one, they're going through mass retirement themselves. They'll hit the peak of that in 2022, just a year from now. And so we're looking at a significant change in the workforce that affects capital generation, that affects productivity, and it's unavoidable, and it's a year away. But just as important, the baby boomers did something that no other cadre of boomers anywhere else in the world did. They had kids. They had the millennials. And so the millennials, for all their many, 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 oh, 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 so dear God, so many faults, have something going for them that no other millennials in the rest of the world have. They exist. Today they're consuming, tomorrow they'll be producing, and the day after that they'll be investing. And that allows the United States to continue with this existing economic model, more or less. The rest of the world, not so much. Let me stack it up for you, give you an idea of the scale of the problem we're facing. Here are the GDPs of the world's top 50 consumption-led system. Ugh. It's a stack of the world's top 50 consumption-led economies by GDP. Here's where they are in 2020, and here's where we expect them to be in 2030, because countries are aging out. Now, that doesn't look like a huge drop. I mean, it's a problem, but it's not a disastrous one. But here's what happens with the export-led systems. That group simply ages into obsolescence. Now, today, we only have one post-growth economy, but in the not-too-distant future. So, folks, we're there. We've already seen how good this gets, but in 2020, everything flips. And we reach the point of no return in terms of capital availability in terms of mass consumption, and in terms of investment, and shortly thereafter, their production. And then there's COVID. 
This is the top six consumption-led economies in the world. I'm sorry, not consumption-led. I just picked six. <laughs> United States and the United Kingdom are two of the largest consumption-led. So is France. So is Mexico. I included India in there so you can see what happens when you uh, when you stop testing. Uh, we know, obviously, that the data is worse than this. What this is is new COVID infections on a seven-day moving average in per capita terms. So the data is broadly comparable. We know that for the United States, the United Kingdom, and France, the numbers are at least double, probably closer to triple. With Mexico, it's probably uh, five to ten times as much. In India, nobody really knows. Uh, but that double red arrow, that's at five cases per 100,000. That's the point where epidemiologists estimate that the virus has become so entrenched in the population that the only way to get rid of it is with a vaccine. What this tells me is that we can look forward to consumption-led economies being a degree of lockdown for the foreseeable future until we have mass, mass vaccination and then maybe a few months thereafter. So if the consumption-led economies are offline and we're reaching the peak of demographic potential for consumption in the very near future, then globalization is already over because we've lost our transition time. And if you're an export-led system, you don't have anyone to export to right now. So this game, globalization, what we've grown up with, what we've lived our entire professional lives in, it peaked in January of 2020, and it's not coming back. You remove the Americans from the equation. You let the pieces fall where they may. These are the parts of the world I expect to see the greatest dislocation and conflict. Now, for those of you who know your economic history, you will recognize these zones as the areas that have seen the greatest economic growth since World War II. And that's simply because of the American-led global order. The United States forced everyone to be on the same side in outlawed war. And for those of you who know your military history, you will recognize these zones as the sites of the greatest conflicts our species has ever fought, because these are where the tectonic plates of the world come together. The base effect growth is over, and we're returning to a more normal historical pattern. And if you're interested in globalization, I'm sorry, because these zones, that's three quarters of global manufacturing supply chain steps, agricultural shipments, and energy shipments. We are literally looking at the end of the world that we know, whether it's from the American withdrawal, whether it's from an end to consumption because of demographic inversion, or because of conflict. And very likely, they're all going to reinforce. Now, that was very depressing. I do have some good news. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to William Shakespeare. That is literally his name, William Shakespeare. He was the second person in the United Kingdom to get immunized. And of course, they made a big PR fanfare of it. I mean, say what you will about the Brits, their ability to capture historical imagination and throw it into a PR campaign, top notch. Now, there are a number of things going on in the vaccination world. The first one up that was approved in the United States and the United Kingdom in mid-December is the Pfizer vaccine. Now, this one is the least impressive of the four. It requires storage with dry ice at negative 70 degrees centigrade. You need two shots roughly a month apart. And it uses technology that's new. So we really don't know what the track record is going to be. So far, its effectiveness looks great. And they've used it to fantastic outcomes in Israel. So it's not that I think it's a bad vaccine, but it requires a completely new and unique distribution system and requires adults going back for that second shot. I'm more interested in the Moderna vaccine, which is now also approved widely. Like Pfizer, it uses the mRNA uh, designations and research facilities, which makes it a relatively new and difficult to produce vaccine but it is a little bit easier to bring into the market than Pfizer. It's a little bit easier to manufacture, but more importantly, it can be stored in a commercial freezer, but it still takes two shots. So fundamentally, it's not that much easier. The AstraZeneca or the Oxford vaccine looks even more promising. Now, the Oxford vaccine had some problems with their phase three trial data, and that's why it hasn't come out everywhere yet, but it probably will be out in February. Manufacturing for this one is even easier, and it can be stored in a fridge, which is great for distribution because now all of a sudden every doctor's office and every pharmacy can participate, but it still requires that two shots. 
which means I'm holding out my hope for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Unlike the first three, it uses more traditional manufacturing methods. It's not mRNA. In addition, refrigerator storage, and it only takes one shot. So it can be put into the normal distribution system right alongside tetanus, polio, and the flu shot. Anyone who can do any vaccination can handle this without any additional work. We expect their data, which so far preliminaries look good, we expect their data to be fully presented within the next week or two, and it'll be approved within a week or two of that. So by the time we get to March 1, Moderna will have more people immunized than Pfizer, AstraZeneca will have more people immunized than Pfizer and Moderna combined, and J&J will have more folks immunized than all the other three combined. And most Americans are ultimately going to get the J&J one. With rates of distribution and manufacturing what they are, I expect all Americans who want the vaccine to have been able to get it by June 1. And that's herd immunity. Does that mean this is over? Not quite yet. Once we can go out and interact with people normally, it is still going to take some time to get back to normal. Give it three months, which means that by September 1, the coronavirus, vac the coronavirus crisis will be in our rearview mirror. We are almost there. I want to end with something that is related to all of this, but kind of on a different path. The United States is in the midst of its greatest internal migration that we have seen since the formation of the interstate transport system back in the 1950s. People are shuffling all over the place. There's three major trends. The first one's demographic. Baby boomers are retiring. They don't want to shovel snow in their old age, so they're moving someplace warmer. The second is a combination of demographic and economic. The millennials have had their coastal urban experiences, and they've discovered that they want to have kids now. In fact, the average age of home ownership in the United States is 32, and the average millennial is 31 right now. So we know that there's a home buying surge about to happen. And they've discovered they can't afford homes in these coastal enclaves, and they certainly can't afford to raise children there. So they're relocating places where living costs are lower. And the point of this map is not population density. The po point is to show where cities can expand and where they can't. Cities that are in green can geographically ex expand in every single direction, blues in most. But if you're orange or red, you're pretty much stuck within the geographic boundaries you have now. And if you want to expand, you have to expand up. And expanding up is expensive. And then the final piece, the third one that's moving people around, is health. Coronavirus has made people nervous about being in close proximity. That's not going to go away in a year or two or five. So people are moving out of the cities that have excellent mass transit systems where those transit systems are necessary. And those are the cities in the circles. So we're seeing mass relocations of people south, west, and southwest. Those are the cities that are going to boom in the future. All right. That's that's a lot. Uh, we're going to have a conversation here with Marco where he's going to do what he always does and try to pick apart everything that I do. And I got to say, I'm looking forward to it. It's been a while. Okay, super. Well, thank you so much, Peter. That was a tour de force. Um, I was going to uh, do a little bit of intro or I guess post-tro uh, about some of the things that you've done. I'm glad you put that slide at the end. Uh, so for everyone out there, Peter has written three books uh, that I think are excellent, fascinating. Uh, the first one, The Accidental Superpower, um, when it was published, it was, I think, very controversial and a lot of sort of the uh, elites in our space. In oh, it Japan. got me in a lot of trouble. It did. It did. And I, and I saw a panel with, I think it was Fareed Zakari and Ian Bremmer, where they were just sort of poking holes at you. But, uh, but everything you said, for the most part, which is really this foundation of the idea that the U.S. is withdrawing from the world, and here's why, secularly and structurally, that is an option, uh, obviously did play out, right? I mean, uh, the famous Jared Kushner line, uh, what did you do for me lately, you know, uh, <laughs> was, was something that a lot of these elites were, like, shocked by, and, and that was the first statement that was given to American allies. And I think... Um, the other thing is also you flashed very quickly. I just want to reiterate it. Zion.com, you can go there and you can read Peter's latest thoughts. 
uh, and obviously uh, look at some of the other things that he does. I want to pick, um, uh, as you said, I want to pick apart your presentation by starting off with a really important thing for institutional investors, sure. which is, you know, the next four years of obviously fiscal and monetary policy and, and the direction of it. Um, and, and it's interesting because you make a very, a uh, very important point, which is the Democratic Party is going to try to expand its big tent. They're getting greedy. They're looking at this business community. They're saying like, wow, this is our opportunity. This is a shot. At the same time, if you look at the exit polls, I would say that Joe Biden won because he actually expanded down in your quadrants. So he went to the populist vote. And if you look at the performance of Joe Biden, at least according to the exit polls, by income uh, levels, Joe Biden won 11% more of the 50K to 100K voter than Hillary Clinton. That's 15 million people that he picked up. Trump only picked up an extra five. So in net terms, Joe Biden won 10 million more votes in what I would say is kind of the semi populist slash union, you know, that like southward quadrant. So how does he balance, you know, this uh, strategy of appealing to the business community and also keep the promises to the populist groups that got him into the office. Well, let me start off by saying that when it comes to what Biden is going to do, we have absolutely nothing to judge that by. Uh, this is a politician who has been in Washington for the better part of the last half century, uh, but has never actually been in charge of anything. He's never managed anything. He was a senator, then he was a vice president under probably the most disconnected president this country has ever had. So. We know what he said, and we know that he contradicts himself about every five to 10 years and completely remakes his ideological makeup. He has no convictions. He may have a plan, and uh, I'm sure we're going to see that unfold over the next few months, but we can't judge whether it's going to work because he's never been in charge of anything before. Uh, he sees himself accurately, I might add, as a transition leader. The question is transitioning to what? And between him and Harris, who is... I like her, do not mess with her. Uh, we are going to be able to see uh, some institutional expansion and ignoring of the old guard in a way that uh, almost is Trumpian, which is kind of exciting. Uh, but you're right, the balance is what he's got to try to do. Uh, it is very, very common for a ruling party to lose seats in the House and the Senate at midterms. And so they really only have one year to make things stick. And I think we're going to see a lot of activity in just the first two and three months that is designed to set the stage for that first election that is going to appeal to both. So on the populist side, we are going to have a record stimulus program of what $1.9 trillion, I think is the current number. I have no doubt that that is going to pass through Congress. I have no doubt that is going to be popular. And I have no doubt it will be linked into the vaccination program that Trump may have set up, but now Biden is going to get credit for completing. That will give him a lot of gravitas with a lot of people, regardless of their political alignment. We are going to see, under the first six months of Biden, the coronavirus crisis wind down. I would be shocked if somebody who has been a politico for the last 50 years cannot make political hay of that. That will also impress the business community. Because if we can get consumption back up and running at the same time, things like his equivalent of America First on government purchases will specifically be designed to stimulate American manufacturing in a way that Trump said he was going to do, but never really used the tools of government to make happen. I can see there being something in the pot for everyone. The only losers in this scenario are the fiscal conservatives, but they have gotten used to losing. Okay. Yeah. Bondholders too, I would assume, uh, as, as this uh, goes on. So let me ask you uh, about this specifically, um, because I know a lot of the people uh, who are watching us right now will be thinking about this. Um, the stimulus package, I, I completely agree with you. There is, of course, a question um, in the sort of investment community, how stimulative will it be, given that the Biden administration is trying to also balance it with tax increases. Now, this reminds me very much of the same questions in 2017. How stimulus will tax cuts be given that Trump and Paul Ryan want to cut spending? We know how that turned out. We didn't really cut any spending at all. As you mentioned, mm -hmm. the spending in the US had been going up even before COVID. So what is kind of the balance that you think that Biden will try to strike with tax increases? I, I don't think there's gonna be much of a balance at all. Uh, we're in an environment of low inflation. 
We've done a huge amount of monetization in the last 10 years. We've done a huge amount of spending expansions the last 10 years, and there has been no penalty to fiscal activity whatsoever. Uh, two thoughts on that. Number one, the fiscal conservatives are being proved wrong. And I'm a fiscal conservative, so it hurts to say that. Uh, but the environment that we're moving in, where we've moved past peak consumption globally means that the economic rules of the game are changing. We don't know what the new ones are yet. Uh, we know in a world with fewer people and fewer consumption and less interactivity that uh, we know that capitalism doesn't work the same way. We know that fascism and communism and socialism won't work the same way. In fact, all four of them probably won't work at all because they're all based on the pie getting bigger. It's just a question of who divvies it up. That, that ends this decade. That ends the first half of this decade. So the idea that the government can spend, 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 or at least this government, the United States holder of the global currency, this government can spend, 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 this government can keep taxes relatively low, this government can monetize, we know that there's a lot of road left to run on. Even the Japanese who didn't have much consumption for the last 20 years have proved that you can get your debt up to 450, 500% of GDP and still limp on. And they don't have nearly the assets that we have to work from. So I wouldn't want to be a bondholder in this environment, but the, the, you're talking an endless amount of money that's looking to flee in terms of capital flight to the United States and an endless amount of money that's coming in from the Fed. So, you know, this stuff is going to get bought up one way or the other. You might not like the yield, but it, it's secure. And so you can have Biden trade away the tax increases, which I don't think he's going to really lose any sleep over. And the people in Congress who normally would have fought him on that are gone. Will this generate problems down the road? The fiscal conservatives would say so, but history so far has proved otherwise. Yeah, no, and I, and I think I completely agree with you. I think that's a great point and everyone listening should be investing accordingly. I think your point that there won't be any balance is really important. In 2017, there was no balance. Uh, it was the Trump administration that for the first time in US history, dislodged budget deficits from unemployment rate. Mm. Usually the chart is one to one and it was like alligator jaws. And I think that that will continue even as COVID abates. I think that's a really important point. Yeah, um, I, I just wanna underline that it, the rules of the game themselves are changing. Uh, the, the economic laws that are, govern uh, everything about trade and consumption, that is changing. We don't know where this is going to go. Uh, so we're going to have a lot of surprises this decade. Uh, I can underline, however, that for the United States, where the consumption-led system is large and intact, and we're married to Mexico, which has the one of the healthiest demographies in the world, we get to watch everybody else wrestle with this first. So, you know, this is going to be a much bigger problem for the Chinese and for the Europeans than it is for us. So we'll be able to look around the world, see what countries are doing and maybe cherry pick best practices as we move forward. Well, let me ask you, you know, like usually during these conversations, um, you and I were always pushed to make these kind of investment recommendations, but I'm going to make it fun, you know, <laughs> and you give me the nice. idea with you give me your, the idea with your map of, you know, like uh, the urban cores that are uh, going to be able to expand. Um, so, um, if I were to give you $500,000, okay, mm -hmm. and you have to buy five condos with that capital, so you're going to buy oh, cheap condos, cheap, you know, 500,000. So, you know, okay. definitely not where I'm based in Santa Monica, you're not getting anything for half a million dollars, but you are going to basically deploy this into five mortgages in five urban cores in the US. Sure. Where would you go? Do I have to live there? Uh, no, no, you okay. can, you, oh, fantastic. this is rental, no you can, yeah. you know, like rental yield. I just want to know, like, how do you articulate your cool map with the geography sure. of the U.S.? Uh, Fort Lauderdale, it is on an uplift, so you don't have to worry about global warming. So all the money from Miami is going to have to go somewhere at some point. Fort Lauderdale's close. Uh, also great beach, also great food. Uh, Dallas, now I would never live mm. in Dallas. It's a hellscape, but... It has some of the lowest cost of living of any of the major metros. It can expand in all directions. It's a manufacturing core. It's part of the I-35 manufacturing system for automotive and soon again for heavy machinery that goes uh, up into the Midwest and down into Mexico. Uh, that is going to be a boom town for a very, very, very long time. Houston, another city I don't want to live in. Hot, humid, bleh. Really Hurricanes, hot. yuck. But it has a barrier island doesn't have to worry about storm surges. 
it like Dallas is a huge and diverse economy. It's actually the most demographically and ethnically diverse metro in the country. That is not New York. It is Houston. Uh, it benefits from all of the manufacturing access to Mexico in the Midwest that uh, Dallas does. It's also the energy hub. And because shale oil is now the cheapest, highest quality uh, energy in the world, no matter what happens with energy policy globally, uh, Houston will be the last man standing in that industry. And that hasn't stopped them from branching out into green tech. And Texas is very soon going to be the number one green tech power generator in the country as well. All of that is headquartered in Houston. And all the surplus natural gas that comes out of the shale fields is being turned into petrochemicals. All that's on the Gulf, Gulf Coast. So Houston just kind of has the best of all worlds all in one place. And all the hard work has already been done. Denver, that's where I live now. Uh, Denver's a boom town. It's a tech city. It will never get into heavy manufacturing in the way that the Texans has, but it has everything that Texas has, low, tex low taxes, low regulation, but it's a light blue state, if you will. So it's a little bit more like Austin, but the whole state. It's got all the outdoor activities that everybody loves. The infrastructure for infotech is excellent. And in a post-COVID world where we don't all come back to the office, uh, Colorado really does have the best of all worlds. You can communicate with anyone. You've got a global hub for transport. And it's easy to integrate wherever you want. So let's see. That's one, two, three, four. Um, look at the Alabama cities. Hmm. Alabama let's has see. a very investment-friendly environment. The people are fantastic. Uh, and it's close enough to Atlanta that it's not really has it, it doesn't have the backwoods feel that the rep reputation would suggest. And it's one of the densest concentrations for foreign direct investment in the country. The workforce is friendly, it's skilled, uh, and they have a very great way of bringing in foreign companies to metabolize the local workforce that you used to see in Silicon Valley before it got ridiculously expensive. And let me add one more to that, Charleston, Charleston, South Carolina. They're even better at FBI than the Alabamans are. Uh, it's the densest footprint period in the country for inward foreign direct investment. Uh, and remember, the United States is one of the few consumption-led economies left. And in the advanced world, one of the very few. So you're seeing a lot of foreign companies, whether it is Airbus or Volkswagen, coming into the United States to set up uh, assembly and manufacturing footprints in order to access that market. And I'd argue that Charleston has done better at that than anyone else. Yeah, I really like the Southeast as well. I mean, on your map, there was a lot of green there. Uh, South Carolina, um, Tennessee, if we can count, count it as part of that um, sure. region as well. So let me use that then as a segue um, to your global views. You know, you, you touched on them a little bit in terms of globalization, um, but um, you've worked at uh, Stratfor before you start, uh, set up your uh, shop. You were the head there of global analysis. And, and so one of uh, the best, the, the things I loved most is that we can kind of like go around the world. So let's use the same tool to get a sense of where you're positive. So let's say, again, $500,000 is your startup capital, five mortgages around the world. We're just gonna assume you're gonna take the mortgages in Swiss francs, so the interest rate is gonna be negative. <laughs> you know, you're, you're winning either way. Um, and so where where are you um, deploying that globally? What five cities do you, are you excited about? Sure, uh, I'd look at New Zealand. Uh, now, New Zealand, the, the, I mean, I lived there for a while, uh, and I, I plan to retire there. Uh, the problem, it was picking the specific city, because, you know, all the foreigners, all, all the capital flight goes into Auckland, which, you know, if you're going to be in New Zealand and you're in Auckland, you, you, have, you have chosen poorly. Uh, you need to go to the South Island. Uh, the weather is more interesting. The people are more interesting. The outdoor activities are more interesting. I would not not do Queenstown because that's the second city that all the foreigners go to. It's overbuilt. It's gotten ugly and it's, it's due for a property crash. So find another place in New Zealand. Dunedin's good. Christchurch is good. Wanaka's good. Uh, it's really a personal preference issue, but all of them are going to be seeing significant price appreciation. And for the most part, New Zealand is not going to be affected by the, the globalization crash. They're kind of on the outside edge of that. And their agriculture is so hyper efficient that they will probably do well for quite some time. It's not going to be a straight line from here to there, uh, but they look good. Uh, I love Sydney. Similar reasons. Uh, actually has manufacturing and finance expertise in a way that the Kiwis don't. 
Uh, the problem with city is you have to pay very, very close attention to the neighborhoods. Not that they're unsafe, but they're just radically different. I mean, this is a city of 5 million people. It's got a lot of variety. Uh, topographically, geographically, demographically, and as long as you do your research ahead of time, you'll be fine. If you wait a year, maybe two, London. Yes, I know it's crazy expensive right now, but the way they've handled Brexit has been so horrendously disastrous mm. that the pound is no longer considered a reserve currency, and the city is going to lose its position as a financial hub which means things are going to crash by the crash because yeah. London is still a world-class city. It still is a manufacturing hub and it's not like all the finance expertise is going to evaporate. They just need to find a new footing. That new footing will require a trade deal with the Biden administration. They negotiated half of it with the Trump administration. So finishing it technically is easy, but first the government has to swallow its pride because the United States is going to crush the United <laughs> Kingdom in the trade talks. And that is going to destroy uh, the, the, the London mile in terms of its, of its financial position. But after that, it will come back. Uh, let's see, Taipei. There is going to be a breach with China. It might happen this year. And by when I say a breach, I mean China, Taiwan, China, the United States. Uh, but on the back side of that, Taiwan is going to be a formally recognized as an independent country, and it will be integrated into global manufacturing systems independently of the Chinese system. So get ready for the Chinese crash and get ready for what comes next, because it's not that Asia is going to cease being, uh, but the idea that China is the workshop of the world, that will end. But Taipei will emerge on the other side of it. If you can wait five years, anywhere in Italy. Uh -huh. Well, I don't like think it. you have to wait for five years. They're giving stuff away for a euro. Well, that, that's the problem, though. You have to wait for the Italians to realize that the current system has broken. And that means you have to wait for the other side of the euro. So once they go back to Lira, get in early. <laughs> and you can probably buy like Turin. For the get a fixed interest now. rate. Yeah. Uh, mortgage, like I, yeah. I, yeah, you can buy Turin. <laughs> well, the culture is not going to go away. Italy's still going to be gorgeous, uh, no. and it's and remember, Northern Italy is the highest value-added manufacturing on the planet. It's just that they make their cars one at a time by hand. It's a different <laughs> model. It's not what you see in Germany or Korea. Uh, there is going to be a place for Italy. They're not going to be caught up in the craziness of the Russians and the Northern Europeans duking it out again. Uh, Italy will come back. You just have to not do it in euro yeah it's interesting you know um during the italian multiple italian crises over the last 10 years i remember one of my colleagues just, 10? One, <laughs> just dead yeah one of my colleagues once said what is it that italians make and i remember the quip by another colleague everything you want everything <laughs> that was, that's pretty <laughs> yeah uh so that's great so let's let's focus on taipei and, and your view on u.s uh, obviously u.s china you know was investment relevant throughout 2019 this year i mean last year it wasn't really that relevant uh the market seems to have kind of settled into a sort of a stasis you know where the trade war and the rivalry between u.s and china is no longer shocked investors you know everyone's kind of caught up on it mm -hmm. um it's in the back it's part of the you know the drapes of our macro environment sure. so what do you where is your view like you're saying basically china is not going to uh uh, you know, it, it has domestic problems. It's not as much of an issue because it itself has is a, is a paradox that will end. So it, take us through that view. Sure. Uh, let's start with that and I'll talk about what's going to happen over the course of the next year. Uh, first, the demographic situation. Uh, one child policy worked really well. Uh, <laughs> so China is now like the fourth fastest aging society in the world. And if that's if you believe Chinese statistics, which you, sh you should never believe Chinese statistics. Uh, there's some really good information that's come out of some defectors that suggest that the Chinese have overcounted their their under 18 population by in excess of 100 million, <laughs> which would by far make China the fastest aging society in the world. Uh, if you remember from that chart that I showed of China in 2000 versus today, there is a block of people that is over 120 million that are aged 25 to 30 right now. That is the consumption pulse that we're seeing out of the Chinese. That is real. I don't mean to suggest that it's not, uh, but the generation coming up behind it is less than half as large. Uh, so we already know that we are in the heyday of what the Chinese can do without global connections. 
The Chinese Navy is designed to project power in East Asia. Uh, it's a co nearly coastal Navy. Less than 10% of the ships can sail more than 1,000 or 1,500 kilometers from shore. That's barely enough to make it to the first island chain, much less beyond. So the Chinese cannot maintain their trade position unless the United States does it for them. So the US Navy has become the single largest factor empowering Chinese success. You add in their overfinancialization, which is kind of like Enron on steroids, uh, to the consumption problem, to the hostility of Japan, to the United States leaving. Uh, whoo, it's just a question of which crisis brings them down because all of them are system killers. Uh, my personal vote is on something happening in the Middle East. You may have noticed a couple of weeks ago that the Iranians hijacked a South Korean, Korean yeah. ship and the U.S. did nothing. Hmm. Uh, so as soon as we get a shooting war anywhere between Kuwait and Taiwan, it's over. Because then the Chinese simply can't keep the lights on, and which is kind of important for an industrialized economy. Uh, so strategically, demographically, economically, uh, this is over. Uh, it's just a question of who pulls the pin. Politically, we have seen Xi carry out the greatest purge we've seen since the Cultural Revolution. I don't think we're going to see a Chinese uprising because of it, but it does mean the system has become incredibly brittle. And kind of the technocratic consensus-based model that we saw under Hu and Zhang and Ding and the rest, it's gone. So it, it kind of like Russia, one guy at the top makes a mistake, it percolates down to the entire system very quickly, and it, it's over. So, you know, we're, we're in a contest here to see how this goes bad first. Uh, as to what's going to happen, a Secretary of State, former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, on his way out the door, threw a few grenades in, hmm. uh, said that any American official can go to Taiwan without, as an American official, not in a private capacity, they don't have to ask permission from either Taiwan or the United States, they can just go. That's like this far from recognition. He also called officially what's going on in Zhejiang a genocide, which we all know it is. Uh, that is going to have consequences for trade policy because within minutes of Biden coming in, he reaffirmed both positions. So the Trump administration did a wonderful favor in breaking the ice for the Biden administration on that topic, and it's only going to build from there. We will see financial sanctions like what now exists against CNOC, which is their third largest oil company and by far their most internationally wired and by far the most technically advanced. It is now under Russian style sanctions. Uh, that is going to spread to the other two oil companies, which means that 70% of the energy that gets imported all of a sudden can't be done in dollars. That's a problem. Uh, we're going to see changes to the trade order as the Biden administration forces the U.S. government to establish alternate suppliers that don't come from China. Normally, I'd be like, whatever, because, you know, government saying, oh, we won't buy from China. Who cares? That was before we had a $2 trillion stimulus package. All of a sudden, that reshapes supply chains the world over. And if we start going after the Chinese, like we've gone after the Russians or the Iranians, that hits every financial connection the Chinese have. Be warned, this is ending. And a lot of manufacturers have ignored the writing on the wall for the last five years. But a lot haven't. And we've seen movements in semiconductors and automotive and textiles and wiring and, uh, and heavy equipment as companies are moving what they can either back to North America or elsewhere in East Asia to prepare for the day that this breaks. And that break is coming. That's uh, very, very interesting and, and obviously very relevant for, uh, for anyone out there. So one of the things that I want to uh, end on is your views on technology and, and a little insight for everyone watching. So Peter was actually my first ever boss in the private sector. So it's and, my fault. <laughs> yes, it's, it is your fault. And, uh, and, you know, the technology part of this is I remember the first ever analysis I wrote at Stratfor where I worked with Peter for four years. Um, was something about Iranian refineries, I remember. And uh, it was, I'm going to say Halloween 2007, and you had a party at your house. And I remember you saying to me, oh, it published. Do you want to see it? And I said, no, no, we don't have to go to the computer. Let's have, and you're like, and you whipped out the phone and, and you had one of the first, I don't know if you like had a chair out in front of the Apple store to get it, but <laughs> you had the first iPhone, you know, and I remember, um, being very skeptical about it. Oh, it doesn't have buttons, you know, like, 
And uh, I when hated I hated the BlackBerry. <laughs> when I saw the analysis and the clarity of it and the maps, I mean, like I got goosebumps just thinking about this. This was my introduction to like this new technology. Obviously, we've seen throughout human history, technology um, creates these you know step function changes, nonlinearity in forecasting. So, where do you think all of your views? Like, what do you think is the most likely to to skew your views into a different direction because you have a method and people who read your books understand this is very much driven by geography, by demographics, by what I call immutable variables. And obviously technology can dramatically change things, i.e. it's mutable. So where do you think technology could have the biggest impact on your views that, that we haven't discussed today? Sure. Uh- the, the technology revolutions that have changed the rules of the game in the past have had to do with changing the relationship between uh, power, like the, the physics term power, muscle, yeah, energy, wind, water, yeah. Yeah, energy, uh, and our geography. So sedentary agriculture, the industrial revolution, deep water transport, those are the big three. It is not clear to me yet that we've got something on the horizon here. Uh, If it is going to be information tech, its impact on transport is at best indirect. Uh, We know that things like EVs, even if they're all magically adopted tomorrow, if we had the manufacturing capacity to replace them all in the next year, all vehicles with EVs next year, that really doesn't change the math. It might make us dependent on lithium rather than oil, but that only gets rid of about 40%, maybe even 30% uh, of oil demand. That's not a game changer. Uh, it, It moves the needle in a lot of places, but it's not a game changer. So if digital technologies, if the digital revolution is going to do this, it's because it empowers some geographies over others. So two quick examples. Uh, Infotech has gotten so good that we can basically eliminate the prototyping process for manufacturing. And if we're moving into a world where manufacturing supply chains that are long and gangly just aren't safe, uh, then things like 3D printing come in and you can have a supply chain that it collapses down from thousands of steps to, to you know, single you fit on a one hand number of steps that happens very, very close to the end consumer, in which case global trade collapses, because all you need is the raw material to make the powder and you're good to go. Uh, That's one possibility. Another possibility is infotech in the agriculture space. Mm, Part of this is gene editing, which is already being adopted. The, uh, the folks who love organic food don't seem to have a problem with gene editing, which makes no sense to me, but whatever. Uh, the organic crowd is always a little odd anyway. Uh, but we're looking at that being able to drastically increase output of crops very quickly. And if you take facial recognition, ironically designed for concentration camps in China, you can apply that to plants. And <laughs> a combine now can be going down uh, a row of crops and it takes photos of every plant and identifies what it is and what's wrong with it. Is it a weed? Is it a healthy plant? Is it a plant that's thirsty? Does it need fertilizer? And it has a bunch of tanks on the back and it just squirts each individual plant with whatever is necessary. You combine that with gene editing and you're talking about a tripling of crop output in less than a decade, assuming you can afford the equipment and the software, which is not cheap. Mm. So in a country that supplies its own raw materials for all of these things, that manufactures it itself and doesn't have a security problem and can patrol its own waterways and maybe empower limited trade like the United States, you're talking about a tripling of what can be done with agriculture in a short period of time. Anyone who is trying to compete with that will lose. And so we can have a breakdown of global supply chains for agriculture and 80% of agriculture globally is based on imported inputs while American agriculture explodes. You wanna talk about something that's gonna cavitate what's left of the system. That's gonna shake it apart. Yeah, I think, I think what's interesting about what you're saying is that there's a switch towards efficiency just globally. And uh, it really makes autarky, which like we all study in Econ 101 is this utopian ideal, but it actually makes it a, a reach, asymptotically reachable goal. And ironically, that obviously makes the world much more volatile because as you say, these supply chains break down and your need to kind of care what another country thinks or wants or 
or, or, or views um, falls down quite fast. It, it so could actually be worse than that because you can have an oligarchic system then when a few countries are sufficiently stable to have these new technologies in place and others aren't. Uh, you remember, if you, you remember your history, back in the 1800s in the early industrial period, the Brits did product dumping deliberately to destabilize economic systems. Right. We're going to see versions of that again. Yeah. Yeah, especially with some of these emerging technologies. And I think that's very interesting. Okay, well, thank you so much, Peter. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I really encourage everyone on this call to pick up Peter's books, go to his website. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. My All pleasure.